Here's your backup. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, I want to welcome everybody. Thank you for attending our session. Um, uh, it, when got the the call for presentations uh, for the Teaching for Learning conference, it's like, oh, we had a perfect one because um, I was conducting a, a, a faculty learning community, uh, which uh, Zara was one of the members of, and our um, it was based on a book called Bored and Brilliant, How Spacing Out Can Unlock Your Most Productive and Creative Self. And um, it was all about ways of how to disconnect from technology so that you give your mind a chance to become bored, as um, the author said, or um, to allow mind wandering to where you can become more creative and um, uh, able to uh, think more deeply about things and and to not constantly be distracted by technology of course that's the ultimate irony because we we just had i think one or two meetings when we went into lockdown and so all of it had to go virtually and everybody's courses had to go virtually and a lot of our faculty had never taught online before so there was all of the stress and and that they had to use the technology and so it was the ultimate irony that that we're having a faculty learning community about how to disconnect from technology <laughs> <laughs> so, but actually, it became very relevant to the situation with COVID. Um, let's see. Okay, let me get onto it. Here we go. Um, so, um, uh, and I'm not sure I'm pronouncing her name right, but um, Zomorati. Um, actually had this 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 was all pre-covid when when the book came out was she had set up this seven step program um in which to help people to identify their digital habits and then to start looking for ways of stepping back from them to give yourself permission to have some me time that doesn't include having your phone right there or having being at the computer or you know having in this day and age you know our technology follows us 24 7 if we let it and so she was saying that that um if you disconnect that gives your brain a chance to start just kind of wandering around and you'll do a lot of problem solving by disconnecting from your devices. But of course, you have to first know what kind of your digital habits are. So she said, track it for a week and you'll be shocked by what kind of usage you have. Um, then she said, put it out of reach so that if you're traveling to work, if you're going, you know, riding on a bus, if you're walking, um, do not have your technology on so that um, your mind has a chance to think about other things and not, oh, I have to answer this email and I have to do this and I have to do that. So just, you know, shovel it away while you're in motion so that your brain can get a slight chance to say, okay, I'm taking a break from all the technology. And then of course, definitely take a day and do no pictures of any kind, um, which I know for a lot of folks and and um, we're just as guilty because um, we, we do a lot of uh, FaceTime with our granddaughter and um, sending photos and, and things like that is just a way of, of being connected to each other uh, because we haven't been able to see her with all of the COVID restrictions. So that, that was a tough one. Um, but then um, th this one's a really super tough one. Delete that app that you're so in love with because it's, it's taking way more time than you really think it is. Um, and then her next challenge was, to, okay, you're in your office, but let's face it, how many of us sit at our desks and eat our lunch and answer emails? I know I'm guilty of it all the time. And so um, what uh, Zomorati said to do is um, just take that time and if you have to, shut off your computer, shut off your phone so that you have some, some downtime that's not being constantly bombarded with things. Her sixth one is to reclaim the art of noticing. I mean, how many times do we, you know, pass through the hallways and things and, and don't pay any attention? 
at Nevada State College, we have a hallway where they it's a changing art exhibit. Like every month it changes, you know, but, but how many times you actually go and, and look at the pictures instead of just walk through on your way to somewhere. So she says, start noticing things around you. And then her last one was um, to, to, after you've gone through all of these steps, to actually put together a plan to where you give yourself permission. And this is something that we talked about at the Lilly Conference a couple of months ago, is to actually schedule time in your calendar that is going to be basically me time where you're not answering emails and you're not checking your class and you're not doing all of the six other things that you need to be doing. Just literally schedule it in so that you actually have that time frame in which to work. So that was the um, main gist of what the book was that we based our uh, faculty learning community on. And we used it as a real launching point to, to talk about how we've been using technology and how we're being forced to use it with the, the uh, COVID-19 and, and how it has just made our, our stress levels go through the roof with having to try to deal with all of this all at once. So I'm for, for the section with the, the book, uh, close with a quote from her that talks about brilliance is slow. And it's like, hmm, that's an interesting way of looking at it that where you, you, know, you have to take the time to think about the ideas and to have the, the quiet time and the solitude in which to let these ideas kind of roam off in whatever direction they want. And that by rushing things and trying to get multiple tasks done all at once, like eating lunch and answering emails, that we're actually coming up with fewer solutions to problems and to other creative endeavors that might have a much more lasting impact than what we're immediately going through. All right, so I will turn it over to Zara. All right, so good morning again. This is Zara Burines. Uh, I am a nurse in profession, so this is about us caring for people and, of course, caring about ourselves. So I'm also a um, Caritas coach with Jean Watson, also trained me to be one of her apostolates, that's what they said. So, but this is what we have to deal with. Uh, Jean Watson is one of the theorists for nursing. So basically we are using Jean Watson philosophy in our school. Actually, this is part of our curriculum. So that's why we produce nurses who are more like caring individual. We are not just knowledgeable, but we get extra like step so we could be caring more to our patients. So I will just share to you a little bit of view of what my training was, so at least you could also adopt it for yourself. So as I said, uh, Dr. Watson is a, um, like a theorist, which is entitled Science of Caring. So in order that we could conceptualize things, uh, Jean Watson created 10 caritas. So the 10 caritas guided us as the new like in commerce of this uh, philosophy to understand the concepts that she's trying to impart to us. So the first character is about, you know, like loving kindness. So basically it says, embrace altruistic values and practice loving kindness with self and others. So in other words, this is all about you loving yourself or it's a self-care. Remember, we do understand everybody is busy. We understand that everybody, but if we will not take care of ourselves, who else will? That's why this is called loving kindness to self, which is self-care because we have to do it. It's our responsibility to take care of ourselves. We have to go back to the basics. We have to eat, we have to drink. As the Sherry said, we are doing two things. We are multitasking all the time. We are eating or answering our phones, we're answering emails. I mean, we're always like, you know, multitasking all the time. But guess what? We have to stop doing that. We need to take care of ourselves. That is basically self-care. Because if you will not do it, if you will get sick, then there will be a lot of problems, right? We are nurses and we do understand this. 
And, and I hope you would also understand, just like when you go to the airports, before you give oxygen to others, you have to put oxygen to yourself. Am I correct? Greg, do you agree with me? Yes, absolutely. You've, you've, you've got to, you're not going to have any gas in the tank. It, it, if you are not taking care of yourself, you're, you're simply not going to have fuel to, to be able to help uh, other people. Yes, thank you so much, Greg. That's exactly what it is. So we have to be well enough. We have to be holistically there for others as well. There is no way that you will take care of others without taking yourselves out of it. So that's why I am encouraging everyone, we have to go back to the basics. We have to make sure that we have time for ourselves. You have time to eat, time to sleep, take your medications. You have to step out from all of the stressors in the world. We do, we do understand that we are all there for a reason, but as a father, as a mother, as a professor, as a patient most probably, we have to go back to the basics, which is the self-care, okay? So that is very, very powerful there. Basic care that we have to do is we have to take care of ourselves so we could, self, uh, we could take care of others at the same time. All right, Caritas number two is saying that being authentically present instill the faith and hope and honor others. Now, I am also going to tell you that I'm also sometimes not doing this because sometimes I'm talking to someone just like I'm talking to Sierra, but I'm looking at my cell phone and my eyes is all over the place. You know, you want to pay attention to the person that you're talking to at this point. So that's why there are miscommunications because this is what I want to do. This is what I want to entail to you, but you are not fully with me. You are not fully engaged with me. There is no authentically presence in the part of us who's listening to them, right? So, and that is a basic like disconnect. So with Jean Watson's philosophy, she really encouraged us to provide authentically present. So we have to be there for other people. If you're talking to your son, to your daughter, make sure that you're paying attention. Close all those gadgets because most of us are talking to others, but we are also, our brain is thinking other things. So that's why this is a lot of, you know, there's a lot of things going on in our brain and we're not paying attention to the details. So going back to the basic, we have to be authentically present with the people that is in front of us, talking at us, be mindful of where we are at that time. Okay, there's another one. The third, the third caritas that I will impose is about the caritas number four, which is develop helping, trusting, caring relationship. So basically we have to create the relationship or a connection from us to other people. It could be our co-worker, it could be our like relative, it could be our wife, son. We have to connect to these people. So if we have some like co-workers who really want, you know, asking some help from us, we have to connect to them. But in order to do that, we have to get this trusting, caring relationship. Now that we are all like virtual, so this is a little bit harder, this is a challenge, but there's always things that we could do. So just like, for instance, we are professors, we have some, um, we have some students who needs our help, right? They don't understand the concept. So well, we could connect to them through Zoom, we could connect them to emails, but we have to pay attention into the words that we have to say, to the tone that we have to impose. I mean, we have to be kind in any way. So even so we are all virtual, everything now is in our digital world, we could still show trusting, caring relationship with others. So the fourth thing that we have is caring in a digital world. So that's exactly related to the Caritas Four. that despite of the fact that we are all in different limbo right now, we are in different world because this is now all digital. 
But of course, there's always ways and means to connect to others. There is no way that we will be isolated with others. We have to be connected. In the hospital, especially now that it's COVID, so we got a lot of challenges for the loved ones who cannot see their sick loved ones in the hospital. They are not allowed to visit. So what we're imposing in the hospital, we're getting some, some digital like um, options, like we will do some FaceTime on the patient and their family. So at least they could see them, you know, not they are not there physically, but at least they could see them still. And then they could still emote their feelings, their support to their loved ones. That's one thing that we could do. Zoom was probably, if you have, you know, relatives or over, uh, or over the world, you could always get into the Zoom, you know, or Facebook Messenger, we could still connect to people because this is where we are at this point. We are all in the digital world and we cannot do them face to face. With this COVID, it's even adds up. So, but it doesn't mean that we cannot care for people still. We could still do our thing. So love and love and care across distance, pace, and time is still doable. We can still reach out to other people. We can still reach out to our loved ones, despite of the fact that we are in COVID, despite of the fact that we are still in the digital world, we can still do things in our own little world. So Ms. Shira, can you move this slide for me, please? So now this is one of the like poem from Jean Watson. You could read with me. This is really very powerful. So it says in here, caring moment. So this one moment with this one person is the very reason we are here on earth at this time. This is, this is very, very powerful because you don't know who is in front of you at this point. It could be everybody or it could be somebody you, you don't like somebody that you love but put it in the point that that person is the main reason why you are here on earth at this time so that's just being you know, like self-aware that we can take care of other people but this is also the time that we have to pause so we're gonna go step out from our busy world so we could help other people as well all right, but that's about it. Thank you so much. Do you have any questions? Or um, tell us your experiences with COVID and how you've um, either been successful at or not so successful at disconnecting from all of the technology to give yourself a self-caring mental break. All right, go, Trillian. You're raising your hands. Hi, thanks. I, I appreciated your uh, your perspective and your your goals. Um, I, it, it's such an irony that, that we're trying to, as you you pointed out, that we're trying to step away, but yet making the connections, especially in the last poem you mentioned, often involves technologies these days. And my own experience is that um, using the technologies is, has become more and more challenging, not technically, but just having to deal with them and dealing with the small problems. And I know that's, that's been the case with students as well. So often in the morning, I take long walks just in my neighborhood and I do listen to podcasts, which is a technology, but it's, it's like listening to the radio. So it, uh, it really starts off the day well. So that's been my approach. But my question for, for both of you is, um, Speaking as an academic, of course, how do you operationalize this? How do you take these, these goals and put them in specific small actions as you're working with students online? So when you have to work with the technology, what are examples that, that you found for, for expressing empathy, for, for connecting uh, with people? And of course, you're not in the same space. The last um, poem that you had basically said, this is the one um, moment uh, with this person, but you're not really with this person. So, so how does that work in practice? And what are some really specific tips that we can use uh, based on your experience? Thanks. Go for it, Zara. So, yeah, I'll start because I think that is more of me. 
So I am a professor with, you know, uh, in College of Nursing as well. So this is really like very challenging, but we put it into perspective. When I go to a class, I have to pause and I have to like connect to my students because I have to make sure that they are okay. So that's also one thing that I learned from other trainings. So I have to ask them, okay, so did you do your self-care? I have to have a poll, you know, like, like you know in, in zoom we could have did you have your self-care yes or no and then they will get into the poll and then i will you know ask them question and they will say yes or no and i could tell that 60 percent 80 percent of them are doing self-care but less there is also like 33 percent did not so i have to ask them so, okay what are the things that you did not do this time so i have to encourage them to share what they had so basically most of the reasons or, you know, we, I just don't have time to walk because I have to study more. I don't have help at home. So I have to do everything at my end. So, but I have to connect to them so that it is, I understand that, that it is really like chaotic on your part, but it is very, very crucial that you have to take care of yourself because your ability to take care of others will depend on your ability to take care of yourself. So in that way, we could collect to them. And most of the students do their self-care as well. So, and I have to ask them to share how they do things because maybe some of the students have good coping mechanisms, but others don't. So now this is now a community sharing from among the students' perspective and me as an out outsiders looking at them. And now at the end, I could connect both ways. What are the things that the students are not doing and what are the things that is very like effective or successful on the student side? So it's basically coming from them. I'm just facilitating both ways, those people who can and those people who does. So it is really nice at the end. And then I usually go, go some like every week. So every module before we go to the next module, like this week, I have to remind them last week, what did you do? Did you do any self-care? And at the end of my announcement, I always have to make sure, do some self-care for this week. So I always remind them that self-care is basic. And if you will not do it, nobody else will. So that's my experience, Julian. Thank you for the question. Um, I also, uh, st uh, well, I was teaching online when we went to COVID and I've been teaching online for many years. So it wasn't uh, so much as, as a shock for my students uh, that other than the fact that all of their courses were now online and they were having difficulties kind of coping with so much all online. Um, so what I did is I posted at the beginning of each one of my modules um, a short video um, that was uh, sounds of nature, um, beautiful scenery. Um, I, I'd actually done this in classes uh, prior to COVID um, that some shots that I had taken in um, in Wyoming of, of the, the high country, the snowy range and stuff like that, the, the mountain creeks and, you know, with, with just sounds of nature and would post those videos at the start of each module, just so it's just like, okay, before you dive into this, take a moment to, to you know, take a deep breath, reflect, you know, enjoy the, the, the a few minutes of just, you know, some quiet, peaceful, natural sounds um, before you dive into things. And I think that really helped the students to to kind of center themselves um, a little bit better so that their minds would be a little more prepared for actually doing the work. Um, I also um, spend a lot of time talking to my students on the phone. I would, you know, that it's like, okay, we need, we set up some time frames that, that I can call you and, and just so that they have a chance to vent and then not to worry about, oh, well, somebody else might be listening in or, or anything like that. So um, I set up phone calls with my students to, to just to kind of check base with them and see how they were doing and let them basically talk about anything that they wanted to, whether it was course related or not. And uh, I think that is what happened in our FLC as well. We ended up talking about, you know, our experiences and what we were trying to do and how we were trying to help the students and um, didn't put 
pressure on on okay well let's just just stick to this program so we just kind of you know whatever you want to talk about that's that's what we're here uh, to give you a sounding board give you listening space um just so that you, that that you could feel that you were not alone in the struggle because i think that's whether you're faculty or students that has been one of the primary things is everybody is has this sense of oh my gosh i'm i'm out here and i'm doing this all by myself other questions comments What has anybody else done to give themselves a bit of a break from from the technology, which I know is really hard to do, particularly with this time frame? All right, I think I could I could start with that. So maybe they could you know relate to me. So one thing that we're really challenging in my part is getting those Facebook. Boy, that is Facebook is just so addicting that you just have to see it from time to time. It's always in my phone. So what I learned was because before I always have an insomnia. I don't know why. I didn't realize I always have my phone twenty four seven next to me. So when we have this challenge, you know, when we have this uh, uh, like community uh, like ideas on how we're going to get this technology. So somebody told me that Zara, you can always turn off your phone and it's good, but I use it for my alarm. I said, you can always get the ordinary alarm. So just to make sure you could sleep. And I had adopted that suggestion and I go, oh boy, I sleep eight hours without interruption. I turn on, off that phone at nighttime and turn it on when I walk up. That is really very helpful. It really changes my life. You know, it's not always there connected to me and then I, do suggest it to everyone as well. We need to dis disconnect, you know, sometimes, maybe every four hours in a day. And that's also one thing that they suggested to us, especially the professors here. We always are busy. We always are getting into all of these things that we do in school. This phone is popping up every now and then. So the best thing for us to be more productive is to turn off our phone every four hours and in four hours, you turn it on and you could see if there's emergency like messages, then you reply. And that's one thing that we have to do in order to be productive, because if you will just be, you know, texting and responding from time to time, you will be out of the loop. So you will be delayed in everything that you do. And I also personally experienced that. So I changed my ways because of this training that we have. So anyone can share their own experience. Um, Leslie posted a comment and a question in the chat. Um, oh. She really liked the the quote from Jean's book that you put up um, and uh, talked about. Uh, let's see what it is. Um, it's also the, the crux of the problem in the mid pandemic teaching for me because those quote moments are happening. <coughs> sorry, constantly through email, text, canvas messaging the struggle is being present with so many individuals all of the time this is what keeps me from being present in myself how do you suggest setting boundaries to protect ourselves as teachers Ooh, thank you so much. okay greg go ahead greg and i'll just uh, just a quick thought number one I've, I've seen some some junior faculty that we brought on board and I've heard that they have given their cell phone number to the students. And I've told them, do not ever do that. That to me is a huge mistake. Um, also, I would create time boundaries around when you're going to be available. I notice I get a lot of, uh, it, in the evenings, I get a lot of email from students and Canvas messaging from students. And I'm trying to be more disciplined about not looking at those in the evening. I've kind of promised that to my family. Don't do that. Let me just, this is going to be, this is going to be an eight to five kind of a thing that I'm going to look at Monday through Friday. I'm not going to be looking at the weekends and letting those kinds of things overwhelm me. 
You've got to kind of compartmentalize the times when you're going to be available for students and when you're going to be available for yourself and your family. And so I'm, I, I, as I try to, when I get home at night, I try to flip that switch and say, I'm going to be present for this group. I was present for the students all day long. That's changing right now. And tomorrow morning, we'll get back to being present for them. But compartmentalizing, compartmentalizing yourself time-wise and not being available, not allowing students to dictate to you when you're going to be available, to me, that's been helpful. Oh, Greg, thank you so much. That is awesome because that is very, very powerful. So we cannot just, because most of the students, you know, there's one time it was Sunday night, 11 p.m. One of the students texted me, Dr. Z, would you, because they called me Dr. Z at school, would you be kind to look at my assignment? I said, wait a minute, it's Sunday, 11 p.m. And this is my time. So I did not respond to that email, uh, to the text, and I talked to them the following day. I mean, you cannot just text me all the time. And I mean, there's a moment that I have to connect to you and then there's a moment that we can. I have to have my own space. And Greg, I agree with you 110%. That is one of the effective things to do it. One thing also that I would suggest, this is what I've been doing. So I train in school. This is just a lot of emails, especially if you're just starting our courses. They're all confused. No matter what you do, they're still confused. You know, it doesn't end right so what i did in my course i created something like okay before the start of the course i have to train five of my students i call them students leaders i will give them as many informations that i could at the beginning and then i will inform them on the very first day that i have leaders here in the class and mention their name if you have some questions please go to them first before you come to me because I found it very necessary because first they have 60 emails of the same kind. Even though I already have an announcement, I already have an orientation with my course, same thing. They will email me straight to the point with the same concepts that I just talked to them. So now it really did help because instead of coming to me, they know now that they could relate to these five students which they could relate better than me because I have a students, you know, like they could relate to student students perspective than a student professor perspective, right? And now it cut off my time looking at my emails. Guess what? From 60 emails a day, I get to five to 10 in a day. So it was very effective and I'm like, wow, this is really amazing. It's working. So some of my professors also get that as their strategy. So they create these small groups and those small groups go to the leaders before they come to me. And of course, I have to tell them that if the leaders cannot say anything or they don't have any opinion about it, you can always come to me. And guess what? If the leaders are confused, that means that everybody is confused. So I had to do an announcement so everybody would be on the same page. Very, very powerful. So thank you. I have a comment. This is Tom Cunningham, Great Basin College. Um, it depends on your role. Um, I, when I was teaching full time, I agreed with what Greg was saying. You have to block out time that's for you and your family. Um, but now I'm in a role where I'm uh, the instructional designer, um, faculty coach, uh, Canvas administrator. And if Greg has a problem with his Canvas class and he needs help with it over the weekend, and I'm on call over the weekend to handle Canvas problems, I have to, I have to block out time that's not in the normal day when most people would um, have downtime when I need to be up and working. So I think a key is finding balance and find that time to look at the mountains, go for a walk. I really like the idea of turning off the technology, and but it is a matter of finding balance, uh, having a time for the technology and a time when you turn it off. I really like that idea. Yes, Tom, I can definitely relate. Um, and, and when... <clears throat> We were all shifting to going to uh, online teaching. I, I I got to the point where I started feeling very overwhelmed because I'd, 
I would have I would start working with one faculty member on on you know some problem that they had and by the time I got done with that I had 20 more emails from other faculty and and try and in feeling that I absolutely have to get through and talk to everybody that day so that that you know because I know what kind of position they're in but in the meantime I'm feeling it's like, I just got to the point where it's like, I'm totally overwhelmed. And I just had, I had to literally carve out some time. It's like, I'm going to just walk away from everything for this block of time um, for, for my own sanity. Right. But when Greg is having a problem yeah. and focused on making sure Greg's problem is solved. And so I also like that point about focusing on that person and making sure you're giving them all the attention that they need and deserve to, uh, help them succeed. Yes, exactly. That, that's a good idea. That is perfect. So we will be there for them, but we have to have a fine balance on ourselves as well, because we are also like everybody else. We are not different from anybody else, right? So if they will find balance, we too, if they need their time, we also need our time. That's what we need. Everybody needs a self-care. And that's the balance that we have to do. Your physical, emotional, spiritual, we are all the same. It just so happened that we some people cannot manage their time properly and they come to us most often because we are stronger than they are. That's what we have to do. But I agree, time balance is what we have to do. And we have to make sure that we have to go back to the basic self-care is what we need in order we could get through and we could be successful in helping others as well. Thank you so much. I believe we're just about out of time. So I want to thank everybody for coming and for your comments. Um, I did put the uh, PowerPoint uh, in our area for our, our block for this roundtable. So if you uh, can't find it or have trouble downloading it, please let me know and I will get it out to you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice day. Thank you. thank you. Enjoy the conference. All right, thank you guys so much. There is a form that I dropped in the chat. And hopefully they saw it. <laughs> but thank you guys so much. Thank you.